two and one ish. There we go. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Andrew Wall. I am the managing partner of CPA for IT. And today's session is understanding RESPs, RDSPs, FHSAs, RRSPs, TFSAs, or investing inside your corporation. That's a heck of a lot of acronyms and one brand new one for you this year, which is the FHSA, First Time Home Buyers Savings Account. So the purpose of today's session is to help you understand the differences in how uh, each of these are taxed and how investing in one over the other might help you grow your net worth. Um, and let me get into my slide deck over here and uh, share with you a little bit about our agenda. Uh, so first I'm gonna start with a little bit about who we are. Um, then I'm gonna talk a little bit about what tax planning is uh, because that's an important part when we look at where to invest our savings. Talk briefly about salary versus dividends and income splitting, but then we're gonna jump right into the meat of this presentation, which is all about where to invest your hard earned savings. And as I said earlier, we've got a new category this year, which is that first time home buyer savings account, uh, which if you are a first time home, home buyer, this is a tremendous opportunity uh, for you. And we'll be talking more about that in detail shortly. But first and foremost, I did want to tell you a little bit about our organization. So as I said earlier, my name is Andrew Wall and I'm the managing partner of CPA for IT. And CPA for IT is an accounting firm specializing in service-based businesses and independent contractors. And we've been doing that since 1984. And uh, the target of this session is for those service-based professionals uh, who have the ability to potentially invest either inside some of these registered vehicles or potentially inside their corporation and understanding what are the pros and cons of using these different savings vehicles. Our mission here at CPA for IT is to help our clients organize their finances, create wealth and transform wealth into a legacy. And this session really is about creating wealth and how we're gonna maximize the returns on each dollar that you're saving and investing. Um, for those of you who haven't worked with us before in the past, we do offer free initial consultations and we do also assist with incorporation services. And some of the unique uh, benefits that we provide to our clients are things like our benchmarking analysis, show you how you compare to the average and the median, as well as our audit representation protection. But I'm not gonna belabor the point about who we are. I know you guys are here to get into the meeting, uh, get into the meat of our session, um, which is really understanding where to invest. And as I said earlier, before we can figure out where to invest, we have to have a little bit of a conversation about tax planning and what exactly tax planning is. And as Albert Einstein says, it's the hardest thing in the world to understand is the Income Tax Act. And I know it can be complicated and overwhelming for many of you. And we deal with clients who are absolute geniuses, but when it comes to tax, it can be a little bit overwhelming. And that's absolutely okay. And our job is here, our job here is to help you understand the implications of what all this means. So first of all, when we look at tax planning, tax planning is the analysis of a financial situation uh, to create a plan or a perspective um, to ensure tax efficiency and reduce tax liability wherever and whenever possible. So a lot of what we do when we're looking at tax planning is look at what we call the marginal tax rates here in Ontario. So these are the 2022 uh, combined Ontario tax rates. Uh, now, this would be different uh, depending upon the province that you're in, but the majority of our clients are here in Ontario. Um, and you can see that we have these different brackets. And the most important thing to know and understand is that when you go into a new tax bracket, when you move from $46,226 to $46,227, it doesn't mean the first $46,000 uh, is now going to be taxed at this higher rate. It, what it does mean is any dollar over that is gonna be taxed in the next bracket. Um, and so one of the things that we talk a lot about is the difference between marginal tax and effective tax. So marginal tax is the tax rate uh, of the last dollar of income that you earn. So if you are earning $250,000, uh, your marginal tax rate would be 53.53%, the highest tax rate here in Ontario. But that wouldn't be your effective tax your effective tax would be to add up all the tax 
that you're paying in total and divide that by your gross income, which would give you a tax rate that is substantially lower because in addition to these tax rates here, we do also have a basic um, exemption, both federally and provincially, where you have a certain amount of income that you get uh, completely tax free. Uh, but this is important to know and understand these different tax brackets because a lot of our tax planning is looking at how we can keep you out of certain tax brackets. And one of the most important things that we're going to talk about in a second is that we can sort of plan um, for the amount of income that you've got based on leveraging multiple tax years as well as multiple income tax planning or income splitting tax strategies that are available to us. Now, unfortunately, the Liberals did put in something called TOSI or tax on split income a few years back, which meant that that did limit our, our ability to split income in certain ways, specifically with dividends, but it still left the ability to do income splitting through salary. And the only issue there is that salary is subject to a reasonableness test. So when it comes to optimizing our tax planning and figuring out how we're going to determine what salary we're going to have, there's a lot of things that we take into account. We can look at dividends as a strategy. We can look at smoothing income across multiple years, because whenever you've got two years of $50,000 or versus one year of 70 and one year of 30, because that marginal tax rates that we saw in the previous slide, you'll actually pay more tax on a year where you have 70 and a second year where you have 30 versus a year where you have, or two years where you have 50. So if we can smooth that income, we can reduce the overall tax. And some of the tools that we're gonna talk about today help us to bring your income down to lower tax brackets as well as smooth income over longer periods of time. We can also leverage income splitting, which we talked about earlier, and of course, make full advantage of that small business deduction, which we'll be talking about as we look at the difference between investing in your corp versus investing in some of these registered tools. Um, and then of course, there's some tax-free loans uh, that we have available to us. We're gonna park that for now because that really is a topic for another day where we do a session specifically on things like home loans and auto loans. Um, and if you wanna learn more about that, I encourage you to go back and watch our top 10 advanced tax strategies, which is a great session. Uh, to help you understand some of these tools like tax-free loans. Um, so now, one of the first things we mentioned was dividend. Um, and what is the difference between uh, a salary and a dividend? And the most important thing to know about the difference between a salary and a dividend is that there is effectively no tax difference between taking a salary and a dividend. Now, that, there's a lot of caveats to saying effectively no tax difference. And that's because they're taxed very, very, very differently. Uh, but there's something called the theory of integration. And the theory of integration is a set of tax rules designed to make it neither advantageous nor disadvantageous to choose either a salary or a dividend if you are a business owner. Um, now, there are some big fundamental differences between the two, uh, most notably around things like CPP, um, which uh, a salary would be subject to um, and which an RRSP would not. And CPP, some people perceive that to be a benefit, some people perceive it to be a negative. Um, we personally perceive it to be a, 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 a positive thing, a benefit, because it's a form of forced savings. So the CPP or the Canada Pension Plan is a certain amount that you must contribute uh, based on the salary that you pay. And there's both an employer and an employee portion. Um, this is not a tax though. Everything that you contribute into the CPP will be directly reflected on the amount you'll have the ability to withdraw upon retirement. Now, there's some whole things around life expectancy and you know, will you ever collect it? Um, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, I'm sure you don't either. But what we do like is this is sort of a forced guaranteed form of retirement. It's probably not enough to live on unless you're willing to head down south uh, to, uh, you know, a third world destination. Uh, but it does give you some form of guaranteed income in retirement. Whereas if you take all your money and you invest it in stocks or crypto or something, uh, the market could go sideways and you could be left with nothing potentially. The other thing about a salary is it's going to be 
uh, it's going to be eligible for RRSPs. Um, and again, some people don't consider RRSPs to be a worthwhile benefit, um, but we do think that they have value as, uh, if at nothing else, as a form of tax deferral. And again, this idea of being able to smooth income, because if we can defer tax to years in retirement, um, and we can smooth income so that we're taking less income today and more income in a year where we would normally take less, we're smoothing those two incomes and avoiding those marginal tax rates and allowing us to pay less overall taxes. Um, now, why would some people choose a dividend then if you know salary has these benefits of not being subject to the toss or tax on split income rules, um, if it's eligible for CPP and eligible for RRSPs? Um, well, there is a little bit more flexibility um, in your dividend, as well as some potentially better cash flow. And that's because if you were declaring a salary, you as the employer must do withholdings on those salaries and make remittances. And the very last day that you could do uh, those remittances would be either January 3rd, 10th, or 15th, depending upon your remitter type, which again, we have a whole nother webinar on understanding source deductions and what those deadlines are. I again, encourage you to go back and check out those webinars if you're not familiar with them. Um, but you do have to make withholdings and remittances to the CRA sooner than when a shareholder would have to pay tax on a dividend. Because with a dividend, what happens is the corporation first pays corporate taxes on its net income. Um, that flows into its retained earnings and a dividend is issued out of the retained earnings to a shareholder. This means that the money that's being paid to the shareholder has already been taxed once at the corporate tax rate. Because it's been taxed once already, the shareholder will receive a dividend tax credit to offset the taxes that have already been paid. Because again, bringing us back to that theory of integration to make things equal. Um, and as a result, they will pay less personal tax on a dividend than they would pay on a salary. But that's only because some tax has already been paid. The theory of integration is intended to make the total of the corporate tax plus the personal tax on a dividend equal to what the taxes would be on a salary. But the shareholder only has to pay the taxes when they file their personal tax return in April. So it does potentially buy some a few more months before when those uh, cash outflows are going to be made. Um, in addition, there is a little bit more flexibility because salary will be subject to a reasonableness test. Um, now, the only thing that we have to worry about now with dividends are these tax on split income rules, which basically make it very ineffective for you to do any income splitting with any children unless they're actively involved in your business. And again, not doing any income splitting through the use of dividends with your spouse unless you are over the age of 65 or they are actively involved in the business. So that's basically our high level understanding of the difference between dividends and salary. But again, these are going to be important factors in looking at our overall planning. Um, because if we want to leverage tools like RRSPs, which we'll talk about later, we're not going to be building up any room if we're taking income in the form of dividends. Okay. So now I want to touch briefly on the ability to do income splitting. Um, so income splitting gives us some added benefits because now we have two basic, ten, or well, potentially two, three, four, depending upon the number of people that you're doing income splitting with. So if you have a spouse and family members that you can do income splitting with who don't normally have other income, you're able to take advantage of their small business, or sorry, their basic exemption, as well as their low marginal tax rates. And so what we would have is if we had a situation where we had one employee who was making $100,000, they'd be looking at paying a total of about $29,958. But if you split that equally amongst two, two shareholders or two employees, and I'm not saying that this is advisable for anyone, you should certainly talk with your accountant before you do your income splitting strategies because we do have those reasonableness rules. You'd only pay $12,758 each, um, which actually is a savings of about $4,442 in cash outflow. But in addition to that, you've also actually paid more into CPP um, because you have now two people that have contributed to CPP. They haven't hit the maximum amounts in this individual situation, 
but they're still paying total low, a total lower cash outflow while increasing the amount of money that you're going to have in CPP pension down the road. So income splitting can be a tremendous advantage. And certainly wherever we can reasonably do income splitting, I strongly encourage you to take advantage of that. Even if your spouse does have other income or your children have other income, if you were making $250,000 and into the highest personal tax racket, even if they're making $100,000, there's going to be advantage of moving income that's above that 53.53% tax rate down into the lower marginal tax rates. Um, and again, uh, you're in situations like things like RRSP limits and room, um, you're going to be maxing out on your RRSP limit because, as we talk about later, there are maximums for things like RRSPs. And that sort of brings us back to what you guys came to hear about is, okay, you know, it's end of the year. We got RRSP deadlines coming up. We've got uh, some money set aside that we want to put away in our savings account and invest. Where should I be investing that? Um, and there are a couple of different options. First, I'm going to start with RESPs, which if you have children, is the very, very, very first place you should be investing. Um, unfortunately, RESPs do not reduce taxable income. Um, but what you're getting with the RESP is you're getting a grant. So the Canada Education Savings Grant is actually some money that the government is going to give you as a result of the contributions that you've made. So that's typically a maximum of $500 based on a contribution of $2,500. However, if you haven't done a contribution in the prior year, you can actually do up to uh, $5,000 and, uh, and, um, and $1,000. Um, and the total maximum CESG is $7,200. Um, so if you're not familiar with the RESP and the Canada Education Savings Grant, um, and this is a grant, this means this money is free, it's not a tax uh, reduction uh, or tax deferral strategy, it's money that's going to be put into the RESP that can then be invested and grown. And then, of course, when the money comes out of the RESP, um, these gains become income to the beneficiary when they're received, which is typically a child, well, which is a, usually which is a student, um, and so they're going to have some additional tax benefits, uh, tuition deductions, book deductions. Um, so it's a very tax effective way to get money, uh, get a gr get a grant from the government, invest that, watch it grow. Um, unfortunately, uh, for many of us, it's still a pittance compared to what the uh, tuition fees will end up being for our children. But this is the very first place that you should be investing if you have children and again it's only available if you do have children but it's available as soon as your children are born uh, the other thing that you might want to consider if you're eligible is the rdsp um, so the rdsp again does not reduce any taxable income um, and you must be approved for the disability tax credit um, but again the contributions that you um, make into this are going to be eligible for a grant and that grant is between $1,000 to $3,500 up to a maximum of $70,000. So again, this is potentially free money if you are eligible for the disability tax credit. Um, so if you're not familiar with it, again, I encourage people to go and check it out on the CRA website. Um, there's a lot more things that are eligible for the Canada Disability Tax Credit than a lot of people think are eligible. Uh, there is a process that you do have to go through and you have to get your doctor to sign off on some documents in order to qualify. Um, but if you do qualify, the RDSP is again, an absolute uh, amazing tool that's gonna provide a grant um, that you can then invest and watch that grow. Um, so now that brings us to where we start getting into with this would I, could I, should I um, strategy. So the first ones are absolute must if you have the ability and where you should invest first and foremost. Now we're going to talk about things like RRSPs, uh, TFSAs, um, and the FH, FHSA. Um, so RRSPs, many people are familiar with what an RRSP is, which is a registered retirement savings plan. This does reduce your taxable income. Um, so for every dollar that you contribute into your RRSP, it's going to reduce your taxable income by that. 
And what this does for us is creates a tax deferral and again allows us to smooth income from some years o over others. So if you had a great banner year and you've earned a lot of income, you can potentially use RSPs to reduce the amount of income that you've got while pulling it out. I do see I've got a couple of questions that have come up here and I'll come to those in just one second once I wrap up with RSPs. Um, so there is a maximum amount of an RSP contribution and it does appear that I didn't update it for 2021. It is still 18%, uh, although um, it is now, I think, larger than 27,830, um, but it's in and around that range. Um, I will update that for our next session. We will be reading this section. Um, but the one thing with an RSP is there is a maximum uh, that you can contribute. Uh, and there are penalties for over contributing. And in fact, there are penalties for over contributing on all the next three things that we're going to be discussing. Um, so this is really important to know and understand. If you do ever get an uh, RSP over contribution um, letter, you should certainly reach out to your accountants so that we can help resolve that as quickly as we possibly can, because there are penalties for as long as that over contribution exists. Um, now, where an RS key can be really useful is if you're a full-time employee and you've got no other strategies to reduce your taxable income, RSPs are absolutely great, particularly if you're in those highest personal tax brackets. Where they don't make sense is if you're in the lowest possible tax bracket, because then at the very best, you're getting a deferral. You're deferring paying tax today until when you pull it out in retirement. And once you do hit 71, you will be forced into a RIF and have to start taking a percentage of that around 5% into income. Um, but it does at least buy you some time before you're going to have to pay tax. But it could potentially mean higher tax rate on that income. Because if you've contributed at the lower tax bracket and got the tax reduction at the lowest tax bracket, but you're withdrawing income at a higher or middle tier tax bracket, you could actually be moving income from a low tax bracket to a high tax bracket, which is why we say we only want to make use of RSPs when we're in at the very least middle tax brackets and hopefully at those highest tax brackets so we can get the most bang for the buck. Now, what happens with money that's invested inside of an RSP is that you don't have to pay any taxes on any of the income that you're earning, whether you're buying and selling stocks or you're earning dividends or whatever the case may be. It just continues to grow in your RSP. And when you take the money out, you're taxed at your marginal tax rate whenever you take the money out. Um, that is a pro and a con because like I said, it gives you the ability to defer when you're paying taxes. But when you look at certain types of tax like capital gains, if you've got a capital gains tax, which is typically only on 50%, you would actually pay more tax in an RSP on a capital gain than you would say inside of a corporation or in an unregistered investment. So RSPs can be very effective um, but it's difficult to determine whether it's going to make sense for your individual situation without having a discussion with your accountant. Let me see if I can pop into these Q&As before I jump into the next sections. Okay, what are the pros and cons of investing in dividend paying equities versus GICs, fixed income uh, inside of a corporation? Uh, so this is a very complex uh, question and let me say I'm going to answer this from an accounting perspective, um, not um, from uh, a, a financial advisor perspective, because I'm not a financial advisor. And, you know, there's different risks with different types of investments. Um, you know, GICs might be lower risk, but the returns probably not quite as well as a dividend paying uh, equity. However, um, this is important to know and understand how the difference between a dividend is taxed versus a um, uh, versus interest that you might have. Uh, so interest is going to be taxed at the um, investment rate, which we'll talk about later, which is um, starts at 38%. Um, and then there's some uh, federal tax abatements. It gets quite complicated, but it is higher than your small business tax rate of only 12.2% uh, here in Ontario. Um, whereas a, a dividend is going to flow into a special account, um, which is called a recoverable dividend tax on hand. And depending upon the type of dividend it is, it could be an eligible di dividend, it could be a non-eligible dividend. But effectively, when you flow that money out to a shareholder in the form of a dividend, you'll receive your dividend refund, which will um, remove all the taxes that you paid on those dividends. 
So dividends have a slightly more advantageous stock structure inside of a corporation than um, interest income would, uh, is the long and short of it. So hopefully that answers your question, George. Um, Kin's got a question here. Uh, what are their criteria for creating a holding company out of a corporation that is currently investing uh, as well as operating consulting at the same time? Uh, okay, this is a really uh, good question. Um, and um, I wanna talk um, quickly about why and when we use holding companies. Um, so holding companies, one, uh, provide us a form of asset protection, uh, but they can also help us to minimize the amount of taxes that we pay. And that's because if you have a holding company, well, if you have investments inside of an operating company, what's going to happen is any of the expenses that you have, including your own salary, will reduce the um, operating income first. And only when you wiped out all of the operating income will it begin to erode the investment income, which is taxed at a higher rate. When we have a holding company, we have more control over dictating what expenses go into which company, including your own salary. So we can leverage that to reduce the lower taxed income first instead of the higher taxed income. And for many of our clients, what we do is we, we preach uh, helping our clients organize their finances, create wealth and transform wealth into a legacy. And part of transforming wealth into a legacy is the use of a holding company. And so oftentimes what happens is when we're creating that wealth, we're building it first inside of our operating company. And once we build up enough money inside of that operating company to justify the cost of setting up another holding company, because there is one downside to a holding company and that is it is a separate legal entity and there are costs to setting it up and maintaining it. Uh, but you know, if your financial benefit outweighs that cost, it becomes a no brainer. And where you're gonna get that financial benefit is by moving income that would normally be taxed at that higher 38% down to that lower 12.2% tax rate. Um, and that's you know with some accounting magic that we've got up our sleeves. So there are, um, there's no criteria. You can switch a company from an operating company into a holding company. When does it make sense to do so? Typically I say you need to have about $20,000 uh, worth of uh, investment income in order for it to make sense. Um, but if you've got more than $20,000 worth of investment income, and there's a whole bunch of caveats in there, what type of investment income, how reliable is in this investment income. But generally speaking, if you're making more than $20,000, you're probably going to achieve enough of a financial benefit to outweigh the costs of setting up that uh, holding company. Now, holding company is also going to help us with another lovely uh, benefit the Liberals gave us, um, which is that there are some rules that say, if you're earning more than $50,000 of passive income, it can begin to erode your small business deduction limit. Um, and this, this does affect um, your total income. So if you've got holding companies and you've got multiple companies, it is the total of all of the companies combined. However, it is based off of net income, not gross income. So again, if we're able to reduce the net uh, taxable income within that investment, we can, have some control over reducing the small business or um, limits that would be imposed uh, by those passive income restrictions. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, and let's go on, we, we're, they're, they're queuing up here. Um, TD Wealth is advising to accumulate revenue in the corporation, spouse pay expenses from salary employed and build investments within the corporation instead of a, salary, what is the benefit of RSP and salary? So that's exactly what we're going to be uh, talking about today. And um, for the most part, you know, I tend to agree with that. Uh, building up money inside your corporation um, versus taking money out and putting it into an RSP is generally a good strategy for a, a small business owner that has a long-term vision of creating wealth and transforming wealth into a legacy. Now, if for whatever reason, you have a short-term vision and you're looking to close out your corporation in the near future, then moving money into an RRSP um, or um, another vehicle like that might make more sense because you don't wanna build money up inside of a corporation because if you ever wanna close down that corporation, in order to close down the corporation, you would have to pull all the money out. But if you have a long-term version of creating wealth and transforming wealth into a legacy, leveraging a corporation as a as a tax advantaged structure, then yes, I absolutely agree with investing inside the corporation. Um, 
Now, uh, thank you, Rachel. The annual RSP limit uh, for 2022 is twenty nine thousand two hundred and ten dollars, which is still eighteen percent. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, is there a difference? Is is there a difference in differing the tax in deferring the tax by using RSP uh, versus keeping the money inside the corporation? Yes, uh, there there is. Um, so, you know, with a corporation, you are still going to pay some tax. Uh, it is a lower tax, so you're going to pay tax at uh, eleven point two percent. So what that means is that you have what is that eighty nine or eighty eight point eight dollars left or eighty eight point eight cents left on the dollar to invest. Whereas if you were to put it into an RSP, in theory, you have the full dollar to invest. That's again one of the advantages of an RSP versus the corporation. Um, however, the RSP, as I said earlier, it's going to be taxed less effectively. It's also going to have less flexibility when we talk about creating a legacy, because yes, it can pass to your, pass to your spouse without any tax implications. Uh, but once it goes on to your children, there are some significant tax implications that make the RRSP less tax advantageous. So typically what you what we're advising many of our clients to do is build up money inside your corporation, um, you know, leverage RRSPs as well. But the goal with the RRSPs is that's going to be what you're going to use in retirement. And hopefully you're drawing that down to close to zero by the time uh, you are um, moving on to greener pastures, so to speak. And so let me let me see where did we leave off. Uh, so we were talking about RSPs, and that brings us up to I think uh, our new, brand new this year, woohoo! Big shining flashing lights, first time home savings account, the FHSA, uh, the new acronym for the year. Um, so this is is brand new this year. Um, so it doesn't come into effect until April first of twenty twenty three. Um, and what it is is. Um, you can think of this as the hybrid between an RRSP and a tax-free savings account, which we haven't touched on yet, but many of you might be slightly familiar with. Um, so the advantage here is that it's going to reduce your taxable income, whatever you contribute to this first-time home buyer savings account. In addition, you're going to be able to take the money out of your first-time home savings account tax-free up to 40000 up to uh, the maximum that you contribute, $40,000 and whatever it grows. So if it, if it does grow to $50,000, you're going to be able to take out $50,000. Um, but the maximum contribution is $40,000 over the lifetime, and it is limited to $8,000 in any one year. Um, and that does include 2023. Um, you are allowed, if you missed the previous year, to contribute again uh, to make up the contribution for the prior year. Um, but uh, it's important to know and understand the contribution room only starts the day you create a first time home savings account. You can also own multiple uh, savings accounts, multiple first time home savings account, but that doesn't change the maximum contribution limit. The maximum contribution limit here is $40,000. And there are a bunch of criteria in order to, to be eligible to take it out for your first time home. Uh, but assuming that you're buying a home for the very first time, you're going to have the ability to take this money out of the first time home savings account um, for, you know, $8,000 a year starting in 2023, um, up to a maximum of $40,000 currently, um, and whatever investment growth that it has, because it can then be invested. Uh, it's going to reduce your taxable income today, um, and then you'll be able to take it out. Uh, now, unlike the home buyer's plan, which many of you might be familiar with within an RSP, because there is a vehicle right now where you can take up to $35,000 out of your RSPs tax-free uh, for the purchase of a home. Um, unlike this, there isn't that requirement to repay this within 15 years. So with the home buyer's plan, uh, basically, as soon as you take out the money, the next year you have to put the money back in. And if you don't, it one fifteenth of that loan becomes income to you. Um, so effectively, you're repaying that loan that you took out of your RSP. Now, the good news is that you can use the whole first time home savings account um, in, uh, you know, paired with the home buyer's plan. 
Uh, so now you've got, you know, $35,000 plus potentially $40,000, which hopefully has grown from there to maybe even 50 or $60,000, uh, which gets you more in line with what you really need to have as far as a down payment, because we all know that $35,000 for down payment in Toronto isn't going anywhere towards what you need to make for a down payment on a home. Um, so this is a new tool um, designed to help people make housing more affordable. Um, it is, if you are a first time home, uh, home buyer, I do strongly encourage you to open up this account immediately, even if you're only putting a dollar in it. Um, as of April 1st, you should be opening an account and putting a dollar in it so that your room grows uh, as far as that you can contribute to it. Uh, now there are some rules if you don't ever buy a house um, or if you pass away that this can be transferred into your RRSP and it effectively becomes an additional um, RRSP contribution. But a, a very nice tool because it gives you a reduction in tax and it's not taxable when you take the money out to put as a down payment towards your first home. Um, now the TFSA, many of you again might be familiar with the, the, the TFSA. Um, and uh, you know, um, the tax-free savings account, unfortunately does not reduce the taxable income the way an RRSP or the first time home savings account does. So anything that you contributed to a tax-free savings account will need to have been taxed already somehow, some way. So if you're taking this money out of your corporation, it's going to become income to you uh, before it can go into the tax-free savings account. Um, <clears throat> the advantage of the tax-free savings account is that it is going to grow completely tax-free. So any growth that you have inside of this, there's zero tax that you will pay on it. Um, in addition, What's nice about the tax-free savings account is that if you needed to draw some money out um, for you know, emergency roof repair or something like that, um, or emergency trip down to Mexico with the boys or whatever it is, um, you can take money out of your uh, TFSA. And if you wait until the end of the calendar year, you'll be able to put that money back in um, and your contribution room will still continue to grow. Um, uh, and you'll be able to put that same amount that you took out back in. Whereas with an RRSP or the first time home savings account, if you take that money out, you can't put that money back in. So your room doesn't come back based on the money you withdrew. It only continues to grow based off of um, either with the first time home savings account, another year passing, or with the RRSP, a function of your salary, that 18% that we talked about. Um, <clears throat> so for this reason, I love the tax-free savings account as an emergency cash reserve. So everyone should have a tax-free savings account. Um, and um, uh, right now for 2022, if you're contributing for the first time, you're eligible to deposit up to $81,500 um, provided you were over 18 starting in 2009. And there are different amounts uh, that have changed over the years, but basically every year there's a certain limit of how much that you can contribute to your TFSA. But I do strongly encourage to people have this first and foremost as an emergency reserve account, um, but also uh, from a tax perspective, it is the only place where investments will grow completely tax free, um, which is an advantage. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about the difference between you know, not being taxed upfront versus not being taxed um, at the outset in a minute, um, but that, well, actually maybe we should just take a minute to, to talk about that briefly now. Um, and um, I think the most important thing to know and understand about investments um, is that when they grow, um, each year, the growth is a multiple of the prior year's growth. Um, so this is called compound interest. So when we start with a larger number, that compound interest is going to grow faster. So if we can start with a dollar that's been taxed at zero dollars or a dollar that's been taxed at only 12.2%, that money is going to grow faster, um, which means that there will be more of it uh, to potentially be taxed at the outset. Um, but um, that is the advantage of having money that hasn't been taxed before you put it in, unlike a TFSA where you're gonna have to have paid tax to be able to put money in. But if you're able to get money out of your corporation at the low tax brackets at tax effective rates and put it into your TFSA, the TFSA is still an advantage tool because you're not gonna pay any tax on the outcome. 
um, right? Whereas with the other tools, yeah, you'll have more money to invest, but you're still gonna have to pay some more tax uh, when you do take the money out of those vehicles. Um, and we'll talk about that in, in a minute uh, when we get to the corporation here. Um, so the corporation, this is a really important uh, tool within your arsenal of savings accounts. And the advantage of investing in your corporation, and whether that's investing in real estate and stocks and bonds uh, and crypto, whatever the case might be, is that the money you put into investments doesn't need to come out of your corporation and be taxed at whatever your marginal tax rate is uh, before it can be invested. So the only other way that you can put money into an investment without it being taxed first is the RRSP. And the fundamental difference between the corporation and the RRSP is what we talked about earlier about the concept of how dividends and uh, capital gains are taxed. Um, so depending upon the type of investments that you have, like if you only had GICs and you're getting any interest, nothing wrong with putting that type of stuff inside of an RRSP because you would be taxed on 100% of it anyways inside of a corporation. But with a dividend, as we talked about, you're gonna have this refundable tax, um, you're gonna get tax credits personally, so it's gonna pay a lower tax um, than what you would pay if you receive that income out of an RRSP. And the same with a capital gain, uh, because the capital gain, yes, it's subject to a higher tax rate. Um, as you can see here, we do have an investment income rate, we have a small business rate, and we have a general rate. Um, so the, the income tax rate is, is much higher. Um, now, when you see these numbers here, 38.7% and 11.5%, there are some addbacks or some abatements that come in. So it doesn't end up actually being like 49% as it appears here, um, but it potentially could be. It usually ends up being closer to like 28 to 30% uh, effective tax when you add in the abatements. Um, but it is much higher than the 12.2% um, uh, small business deduction rate, right? Um, so that investment income is going to be subject to tax. And now, this is what, what we're talking about investment income here is now gonna be uh, interest income and capital gains. And on the capital gains, even if you were paying the 49%, it's still only 49% on half that, so it makes it only about 25%, which for many of you is still lower than your personal tax rate um, that you would be taking money into as far as an RSP was concerned. And so this is one of the big advantages of a corporation. Plus a corporation also has the ability to be passed on as a legacy to you, the next generation. Um, and this is one of the big things that we preach a lot about is organizing your finances, creating wealth and transforming wealth into a legacy. You'll hear me say it over and over and over again. And the corporation is a great vehicle for doing that because the corporation is a living entity that survives its directors and survives its shareholders. Um, so that is a really important tool, whereas an RRSP uh, does not. Uh, right, it will be passed on to your spouse tax-free, but once both spouses have passed on, uh, there are gonna be some significant tax implications um, for passing that on to the next generation um, or, or the legacy that you wish to create. So this is why we tend to err in the favor of corporations. Um, but basically, you know, the reality is everyone's situation is unique. And I know people hate hearing that, um, but what we wanna look at is a holistic plan where we're probably gonna take bits and pieces of all of these tools based on your individual situation. Um, so like there are some no brainer ones if you're eligible for them. Like the, you know, the first time home savings account, I would say is a no brainer if you haven't bought a house yet. Um, the RESP if you've got children is a no brainer. The RDSP if you're eligible for the disability tax credits is a no brainer. Uh, the RRSP and the tax free savings account and the corporation is where we're gonna have a little bit more of this um, melting pot where we construct a plan based on your individual situation and based on how things flow along your career trajectory. Because many IT consultants, it's not uncommon for them to set up a corporation, work in the corporation for a number of years, but then go take a break to maybe go work in industry because they got a tremendous opportunity or they wanna work with a specific skill set to go back into industry and take a full-time job. And they may wanna then use the RRSP strategy um, to you know, lower their T4 income uh, in those years and then coming back to the corporation, which is going to be the legacy um, or maybe just continue on as a holding company while they remain as a full-time employee. And then of course the TFSA 
is a really, really uh, great tool and I, I strongly encourage people to take advantage of it. However, if you're already taking out $250,000 out of your corporation, I'm not gonna advise you to take more money out at the highest possible tax rate to contribute it to a tax-free savings account because now you, you know, you're gonna have less than, you know, what is that, less than 47 cents on the dollar to be able to invest and watch that grow. And because of that compound interest curve, that's gonna take a lot longer to reach critical mass than it would if it were invested inside your corporation. Um, now, there are other things that you might wanna consider. You know, interest rates are changing, but things like home loans, you might still be able to get a reasonable uh, home equity loan that you could then take and put into a TFSA. And if you're generating a return that's higher than your cost of borrowing, uh, you've got some advantages going on there. Uh, but that's getting harder and harder to do as interest rates continue to climb. And it's not as effective as a strategy as it was when we were getting uh, loans for subprime uh, rates, right? Um, but uh, the last thing to talk about is an unregistered investment. Um, and this is the least desirable of which um, it, it does not reduce any taxable income. It is completely subject to whatever your personal tax rates are. Basically, the only reason that you may do this is if you'd inherited a bunch of money, you already have it outside of uh, a structure, you've maximized all your RSP contribution, all of your TFSA contribution, all the other contributions. That's about the only time that you might use an unregistered investment. Other than that, it probably makes more sense to use one of the other vehicles uh, to do that, but it is still an option and does play into a very small select group people uh, portfolios there. Um, so now I've, I've gone through a windfall here. Um, I've answered a few questions along the way, uh, but I'll give you guys a, question, a, a few moments. If you have any more questions, I'd be happy to take a few more questions now as I take a sip of water. And if not, I want to thank you guys uh, for taking the time out of your schedule to join us. We've got a few people joining us here live on Facebook. We've got over uh, uh, 25 people joining us uh, on Zoom here as well. So once again, thank you guys uh, for taking time out of your lunch. Hopefully you found this helpful. Um, you've got a little bit more insight as to whether you want to actually make an RSP contribution uh, before the March 1st deadline. Um, again, remembering that if you do own a business and you're taking the money out of your business, it's going to become income first. That income will be offset by the contribution you make, but we also potentially have a timing difference um, because the income might be coming out now in February or March, and it might be reducing income that was declared in a previous fiscal year. Um, and so what you might end up with in a situation is, yeah, you've taken this money to put a big RSP contribution, but you're going to pay the piper when you sit down and go to your tax planning next year because you've taken out fifty, a hundred thousand dollars to make an RSP contribution. Um, now, again, if anyone is looking at dissolving your corporation and you've got a bunch of RSP room, you know that's another great place where an RSP might make a really effective tool to take your money out of your corporation, put it into your RSP. Uh, it won't effectively become taxable to you until you're in retirement and you're pulling it out, um, and allow you to potentially close your corporation down now. So I hope that helps. It looks like uh, there's no further questions coming through. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us on today's session. Um, we do have more sessions coming. We're gonna do a repeat of this one, um, as well as we're gonna have some more sessions coming. They're not up on our website, but they will be up very soon. And uh, we do have one more uh, question that's snuck in here. Uh, any specific advice if you have capital losses in your account? Uh, Yes, but it's easier said than done. Get some gains to apply those losses against. Um, so if you do have capital losses, and this applies both inside your corporation as far as, as well as inside registered, unregistered investments, doesn't apply to a TFSA, or, or, sorry, it doesn't apply to a TFSA or an RSP because TFSAs and RSPs, in TFSA, you're not taxed on gains, you're not taxed on losses, no impact whatsoever. Uh, in an RSP, uh, you're just taxed on what you withdraw, so losses don't matter. But in an unregistered or inside a corporation, if you have capital losses, those losses can be applied against gains. So if you have gains in the past, up to three years, you can apply those against previous gains and get a refund. If you don't, and I'm assuming you don't in this situation, unfortunately, those will have to carry forward until such a time that you do have a capital gain to apply those losses against. 
Um, so the advice is simple. Yeah, go out there and grab a whole bunch of gains um, and apply those losses against the gains. So if you've got a whole bunch of stuff, um, you want, might want to do some tax gain selling. Um, which is to realize some gains and lock those in because you won't effectively pay tax on them anyways. Um, and you can apply those losses against those gains. Hope that helps. Again, thank you everybody for joining us on today's webinar. If there's no more other questions, I'll see you at the next one in a couple of weeks. Bye for now, everybody.